Hi there. Uh, welcome back. Great to be back. I hope you have had a, a good start to the afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining me again. Lovely to see you all back. Uh, let me just take this text off the screen. Oh, there we go. Right. Um, so uh, I'm just going to run through very briefly some of what we talked about uh, this morning. Um, and then I'm going to look at the second lot of the three strategies uh, that we've been talking about over the last few days. Um, first of all, um, is there anybody here who has any questions um, about uh, the previous video and that I may not have answered? I have been keeping an eye on, on the comments on, on the previous video, um, but I haven't looked at them in... Uh, last half an hour or so um so if you have a question and you're here in part one that i haven't answered yet please do just leave it in the comments here and i will uh come and answer that first of all so um i'm not sure what's going on with my hair up there i think the uh, headphones are making it look like i have a wig anyway apologies for that so um so what we're going to do is I'm just going to run through very briefly um, what we started with in the last one for those of you who weren't uh, with me on part one. Uh, and then we'll jump straight into the next three strategies, take a look at them, and I'll answer any questions. And I'll work in the same format as this morning where I will run through the strategy. Uh, and then if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments and I will come and answer them. I'll move on to the next strategy uh, and repeat the process. And then at the end, if you have any questions on me, about any of those strategies um then i will come back to those as well if there's anything that you've forgotten to ask if we got it along so um a quick recap in that we are um first of all the there are no on-course bookmakers at the moment and that means um that the sp odds cannot be calculated the way they are traditionally calculated for that reason you should be very cautious with your betting um just do fun betting because at the moment no one really knows how it's going to pan out over the first few days first weeks with the sps not being calculated by the on-course bookmakers um so we need to keep an eye on that. We need to be looking at what's happening there, make sure that the over rounds at the bookies aren't getting bigger, um, make sure there's nothing going on that uh, we wouldn't expect in the normal course of events. Um, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing I would like to get out of the way, a bit of housekeeping. Again, uh, this morning we went through it in a bit more detail, but um, the, what we're looking at today is a short-term approach uh, to try and find as many winners to allow us to bet on as many races as possible in this first week of racing resuming um it's not a long-term approach it's not a long-term strategy to bet like this it's a kind of a get in quick and get out quick and we usually use this at festivals where maybe two or three days um at seven days is kind of about the maximum that you want to use it but it allows us for this first uh, exciting week of racing resuming it allows us to kind of have a lot of action across a lot of races um and what we're going to do uh, across those races is uh, we're going to stake in a slightly different way. Um, so the way we're going to stake is uh, I recommend that you take the amount of money you are prepared to lose, and we should never bet with more than we're prepared to lose. So we take the amount of money we're prepared to lose and divide it by seven for each of the seven days. And that gives us a bankroll for each of those seven days. And then on each day, you take the bankroll for that day and divide it by the number of races that day. Um, and that allows you to have that amount of stake money in each race throughout the day. Now, if you only want to bet on certain races, if you only want to bet on sprint races, for example, or handicaps, then just take the number of handicaps that day and divide the daily bankrupt by the number of races. And this is the fixed amount that you're going to bet per race. This is your maximum liability. This is your maximum risk. Um, from there on, whenever you get a winner, whenever you get some returns, you take all of that return, the profit and the stake, and you move it to the side and you don't touch it again. You don't bet on it. And the idea is, is we go into this with um, a set amount of risk and we hope to come out with more than we went in with. That is our aim. Our aim is to come out with more than we went in with. But we know we cannot lose more than we started with, which is why we take any return, any profit, including the stake, out and we put it separately. Uh, if you need to withdraw it from your uh, bookmaker or your Betfair account to do that, then do that as it happens. Whatever you do, make sure that you do not re-bet your profits. Um, 
Okay, so that's that's the uh, that's the approach there, Philip. Thank you. I'm pleased it sounds much better. I don't know why. I've not done anything different. Um, maybe I'm talking a bit louder now. I'm not sure. I have got a Coke here, so there is a bit more sugar in it. Um, although I did have a coffee last time, so I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe that's the reason. Right. Okay. So if there are no questions on that, um, I am going to uh, move forward into the first strategy. Um, so, yeah. so I'm actually going to do this a little bit out of order to the way I did them in the email. And the reason for that is um, the 430 race is suitable for uh, one of those strategies. So I'm going to look at that one first. Uh, and that strategy uh, went by the name of Profitable Trainers. So I'm just going to um, start sharing uh, my uh, my uh, screen again so you can see what I'm doing. And if you want to follow along, uh, please do log into your members area and um, and you can follow along from there. Um, so here we go. There we are. You can now see uh, my members area. Bring that up and swap it around so we can now all see that there. Excellent. Um, okay, so profitable training. So I'm going to start by opening the 430 race here. Um, oh, and it's just brought me back to logging in. Hang on one second. Let me just log in. Sorry, it must have logged me out there by mistake. I'm not quite sure why. Um, so I'm going to go into uh, the 430 race um, and... Once we're in the 430 race, I'm going to open a race card. If you're already in your members area, I'm going to open a race card um, called Trainer Profits. Now, the race cards, as you can see here on this race that is um, that's now open, uh, Trainer Profit, the race cards are up here on the top right. And if I click on that, we get a drop down. Now, you probably haven't got as many as this. I mean, you might have more. I don't know. But uh, you probably haven't got as many uh, race cards as this. Um, and you will see Trainer Profit is there, and it looks a bit like this one here. You can see my cursor over it uh, just above my head. So I'm going to click on that, and, and that will reload uh, the race card with those ratings on it. Now, once we've done that, and, and that race card I've added for the moment, I've added it temporarily to everybody's members area so you've got access to it. Um, it will be removed in the future, so if you like it, please do take a copy of it. Um, and if you're not sure how to take a copy of it, um, you can see how to do it in the training area or you can leave a message in the forum and we can show you how to do that. It's not a problem. Um, but if you want to keep it, take a copy of it. Now, I've selected that trainer profits race card. And what I'm looking for is any horse that has made a positive profit. And you'll see that on this race card, I've got only three factors here, three pieces of information. I've got um, trainer runs for the distance and the race type. Trainer strike rate for the distance and the race time, and trainer profit for the distance and the race time. Just three um, pieces of information. The one we're interested in is the trainer profit for the distance and race time. So I'm just going to click on that column twice, and that will sort it in order of profit down, uh, going down, highest profit to lowest profit. So if we come straight to the bottom, we can see here Indian Sounds Trader has had minus 89 units. Um, on this distance and race type in terms of profit if you were to flat bet each of the horse. Um, and at the top here, we've got Queen of Kalahari with 10 points if you were to flat bet each of this trainer's horse horses over the same distance and race type. Okay, so that's nice. And we're interested only in the ones where the trainers have made a positive profit. So again, I'm just going to select the horses, and I do that just by clicking above the horse's name. We don't click on the horse's name because clicking on the horse's name will open the horse history. We click just above that horse's name. You'll see it highlights uh, the horse in green. It just makes it a little bit easier to see what we're doing. So I've highlighted three trainers on this race card um, that have made a positive profit. And the next thing we want to do is we want to verify the strength of these runners. Now, how do we verify uh, the strength of runners. Hi, Martin. Thanks for joining. Nice to see you here. Um, great to have you uh, join us today, this afternoon. Um, so how do we determine the strength of runners? Well, there's a number of ways we can do this, and you've probably seen me in the past go into uh, race histories and use various factors, and, and we can do all of that. And all of that is uh, right and relevant. We can do that. Um, however, we can also do it very, very quickly by just seeing um, if 
our selections, if our possible contenders, our possible selections are in the top half of the market. Very quick, very rough and ready approach. Generally speaking, most of the winners come from the top half of the market. The whole point of what we're doing today is to find rough, ready, quick approaches, jump in, jump out. We're looking for winners. We're not trying to find long-term profits here. We're just trying to find some winners. Um, so to do that, we sort by the Betfair odds. And we can see straight away Puchita is not in the top half of the field. Um, there are 12 runners in this race. Um, and we can see that the other two are in the top half of the field. But Queen of Kalahari is only just in the top half of the field. So I'm just going to unselect Pachita. It's worth pointing out as well, if I sort again by uh, trainer and profit, Pachita is the lowest profit from those trainers. So I'm just going to unselect Pachita here and resort by the current odds in the market. And that, that gives us two contenders. So you can see this is very quick, a very fast, um, very fast way of finding possible contenders in a race. And now we've got those two. We've got Fox Hill and Queen of Kalahari. Um, we can do one of two things. We can either now go ahead and determine how we want to bet, or we can try and confirm a little bit more uh, which of those horses might be the strongest or just confirm that they are amongst the strongest, that they do have a good chance of contending in this race. Um, and as we have a, a little bit of... Um, as we have a little bit of a... Uh, time at the moment uh we'll go and have a quick look at some of the ways that we can we can confirm where they're going to be strong um martin thank you i i know you have indeed you've been you've been with me a very long time a very long time great to have you on here as well um okay so let's see how some of the ways we can use to um confirm whether they are now the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to come back to the standard race card uh, i could use one of my other ones um, but I'm going to stick with standard for now. Um, and opening that up, we'll see. You'll notice that actually both those horses are still highlighted, even when we change the race card. I'm going to sort back in odds order there. Uh, and we're just going to have a look. And the first thing I notice is that both these horses are ranked number one and number two for uh, the 5278. That's a really good, good um, positive. Now, if you join me earlier today, you remember on the 5278 strategy when we were looking at uh, the two-step strategy, sorry, I should say, where we used the 5278 rating. Uh, we were looking at horses that have run in the last kind of six months, roughly. And Queen of Kalahari has, and Fox Hill's run in just over six months. Sorry, I should say eight months. I'm talking six months pre-lockdown, uh, pre uh, the suspension of racing. Uh, and Fox Hill is kind of around that time frame as well, a little bit longer, maybe just over that six month period, but near enough. Again, it's just another tip, another positive confirmation. Um, both have had um, a good number of runs in the last 10. Um, and now, now we get into something a little bit more interesting. First of all, we get the best ever speed. And interestingly, the Queen of Kalahari's best ever speed is much better than Fox Hill's. And if we look at PFP, which is a form-based, Queen of Kalahari is, again, much better than Fox Hill. So we can use some of that information there. And what that tells us is that both horses are potentially strong. Uh, Queen of Kalahari might have a slight edge despite being slightly lower odds or could perform slightly better than expected. Uh, however, this is a five furlong race, but it is being run on standard to slow. We could go into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, we could open, let's say, Fox Hill's... Um, past races and let me just share that with you here uh, and take a quick glance down and see um, exactly what we've got so we've got a win here five furlongs uh, on the flat notice actually that most of these are on the flat um, and that's going to be a feature i think to be honest um coming is going to be a lot more uh, turf horses running on the all weather but five furlongs good to firm probably a bit fast but it won heavy five furlongs it did not do well. Um, good five furlongs, it won. Um, coming back down here, good to firm, uh, contended well. Good to soft, did not perform well. Okay, and that's the second time that has happened. Um, so it, the, the, the few pieces of information we've got here, and, and that, uh, that form continues with seven furlongs over heavy. It performing worse. So while we've not got any all weather performance, we can see that generally the slower ground doesn't suit this horse very well. Today the ground is standard to slow. We don't know how this horse is going to run on standard to slow, but there is a possibility it is going to find it a bit 
of a struggle. The one um, all-weather race that has happened, um, the horse did not perform well. So that's Fox Hill, um, a little bit of a concern there over the ground condition. Okay, let's um, come back here and open Queen of Kalahari. Right, okay, and you open the horse's form just by clicking on that horse's name. And here is uh, the form for Queen of Kalahari. Um, now, we're going to do exactly the same thing. And this is just another way of doing it. If you've got a little bit more time, we can just dig a little bit deeper. This horse has run a lot on all weather. Um, all the most recent ones are on standard. And all the performances are very, very good. Look, we've got lots of wins here, a place. Uh, but they are over six funnels. Uh, let's keep going down because we've got a few uh, standard to slows here. And immediately we see um, a drop in performance. Uh, although this is going back a fair while, there's a drop in performance on standard to slow. Um, however, these are six furlong races, and today's a five furlong race. Um, likes five furlongs, although this was a flat race here back in 2017. We like five furlongs, um, performed okay there. And we've got some more five furlong races down here where the horse performed well as well. I'm um, also interesting in a five furlong race on soft ground here uh, at the bottom, the horse won. Um, carrying 811 in a class four uh, with 5,000 prize money. Uh, this is a class five uh, with only three and a half thousand prize money, but these races aren't quite as we would expect them normally. Um, so while this horse may perform worse on standard to slow uh, than it does on standard, there is still a possibility uh, here for that runner, and it looks like there's more of a possibility for Queen of Kalahari than for Fox Hill. Um, okay, uh, thanks for joining, Graham. I uh, hope all is well. Um, so I hope that's making sense so far. Um, if there's any questions on where we are, then please uh, do let me know, because what we're going to go into now, there are other ways that we can look to see if the horse is strongest, um, but we found uh, two ways here. We've had a look at the ratings that on the standard race card. Uh, we could go into a more detailed race card, like RD Overview. Um, but we're trying to keep this short and quick uh, and find strong horses as quickly as we can. Um, we know that both these horses rank well for 5278. Both have run well kind of within the last six months before lockdown. Both have had a good number of races. Uh, we know that between the two, Queen of Kalahari has a best, uh, a better best ever uh, speed rating. Uh, we know that Queen of Kalahari has a better PFP score, which is kind of a collateral type of collateral form score. Um, so both of these are very strong uh, indicators that Queen of Kalahari might have an edge. We then actually, as we had time, we jumped a little bit further into the horse history, uh, uh, and it looked like Queen of Kalahari maybe. Um, have that slight edge on Fox Hill. Um, so we sort by odds, and uh, and actually Queen of Kalahari is now fifth in the market. So let's just jump over to uh, the Betfair market and see where we are here. Um, if you have any questions, please do drop them into the comments, um, because uh, once we've gone through the betting, uh, I will answer any questions, and then we'll move on to the second strategy. Uh, so here we are, and we can see Queen of Kalahari um, is currently fifth in the market. Um, pushed in a little bit. Sorry, excuse me one moment. Um, Fox Hill is kind of closing. Like the gap between Queen of Kalahari and Fox Hill is closing since we, we started looking at this race. Favorite is Be Proud, uh, and followed by Indian Sounds. Um, so... That's how the market looks, um, and how are we going to bet on Queen of Kalahari? Now, the aim of this is to have as many um, winners as possible and to reduce our risk as much as possible. We've got one selection in this particular race. Uh, currently going off at odds of 12.5. We look at the place market, and this is three, um, three places for standard. Uh, Queen of Kalahari has odds of 3.9, uh, which is really quite, quite good. If we come down to the four places, Queen of Kalahari has 2.82. And I'm not going to look at the two places because I'm not sure there's any point with the odds being what they are for Queen of Kalahari. Immediately, I am thinking uh, that I'm probably going to do an 80-20 bet on this. Uh, but you could just do a, a place bet if you wanted to. 
Um, now, Queen of Kalahari is uh, horse number one. Fox Hill is horse number high. And let's just have a quick look at these here to see if any of our horses, uh, Fox Hill, Thomas Hoffman. No, I was just checking the A versus B to see whether our two selections may have been in there, but they're not. So looking at the market, we have the choice of we could go for a win, we could go for an each way, a place in one of the various place markets, either two, three or four places, um, or we could do an 80-20. My preference here will be an 80-20 because I think Queen of Kalahari has a good chance of winning. Um, and at the same time, I don't take too much risk, so I'm going to place 80% of my stake. Now, let's say we're placing £10 a bet. If I come over to four places and we place eight pounds which is 80 percent of a 10 pound bet you can see here uh over here we would make 14 pounds 11 profit if this horse comes in the top four um and that more than covers our two pounds stake that we would have on it to win um we could go for three places instead let's go for three places here and you can see obviously the odds are going to be significantly higher um, uh, and if we put that in, you can see you make £22.34 profit if you went for three places and the horse came play. So, again, significantly more than the market. But being risk adverse, I would probably go for uh, the place here uh, for 80% of the stake. Um, so, for example, that uh, kind of like that. Uh, and then you come back to the win and you would place the other 20%, which on uh, a £10 bet would be two there. And, and that's what it looks like. So it looks like, um, you know, if that horse wins, you're going to walk away with £22 on the win market and um, £13 on the place market. The odds had actually already dropped by me taking that look. 2.76 is now bounced back up to my anyway. Um, £22 on the win market, £13 on the place market. So you'd be walking away with something around um, £35 profit. Uh, and if the horse just places, you'd be walking away with £13 on the win, on the place market minus your £2 win bet. So you'd still be walking away with about £11 profit um, on a £10 bet. So you're still walking away if the horse places in the top four with over 100% return. So that's kind of how an 80-20 bet works. Um, you've got to have enough margin in there. Now, for example, if you're going to try and do that on Be Proud in this market, and you put £8 in, um, you see, it would still work even at 1.53 because... If the horse, if B Proud comes in the top four, you're still going to, uh, and doesn't win, you're still going to walk away with your four pounds minus your two pound stake. So you're still going to walk away with about two pound profit uh, on a 10 pound stake. So you're still walking away with about a 20%, um, a 20% return if the horse places, and obviously much more if it wins. Um, so this is how an 80 20 bet works, how it reduces the risk. Um, generally, I like to have a minimum of somewhere between five and 10% um, on them. Um, after the cost of the win bet uh, so that's just an idea of how that how that works okay is there any questions so far on that uh philippe yes absolutely do you ever cash out when profitable for the off uh, good question um personally i generally don't um i tend not to trade uh, that's not to say it's right or wrong there is no right or wrong here it's kind of more uh, about your your comfort zone um and a lot of people who do prefer to cash out um and uh, and de-risk in that way um, and if you're going to do that it's important to know what threshold you want so actually how much are you looking for to cash out either for the profit or the loss both ways um and so you've got that there and you have to know that obviously the horse some of your horses will win uh, at which point you can't kick yourself for thinking well i shouldn't have traded out because if your approach is to trade out then that has to be your approach um, you can't then say, oh, I shouldn't have traded out on that just because a horse won. Um, okay, I hope that makes sense. I hope that's clear. So you should stick with the strategy and go with it. Um, and if the approach is trading out, you accept that you're going to trade out sometimes for a profit, sometimes for a loss, but your risk is going to be that much lower depending on how much you're trying to trade out by. Um, and you should determine how much you're going to trade out by before you go into the race. Um, and, and then that becomes your strategy. Okay, are there any other questions um, on that uh, that that first approach? Okay, um, that's fine. I don't think there are. Uh, if you think of any in the meantime, then please do um, just leave them in the comments. Come back, uh, let me know, and I will come back to them at the end. 
Um, don't forget, if you are enjoying uh, these Facebook Live sessions, please do hit the smiley button, the thumbs up, the heart, whichever icon you would like in the uh, emotions section, because it just lets Facebook know that you're enjoying um, the Race Advisor's Facebook Live. Um, right, let's take a look at um, the next strategy. So the next strategy um, I'm going to look at is called the sprinters win. Now, this requires specific race conditions. And actually today, unfortunately, there aren't any race conditions that meet it. Pardon me. So I'm going to find uh, a historic race. Well, I found already a historic race that I can walk through this strategy on you. Um, but over the coming days, as we get more than one course, you should find um, at least a couple of races that meet this criteria each day. Uh, some days you might have have more than that. Uh, some days there might only be one. But usually there's at least one or two a day and some days more. Um, so to keep it kind of within the sort of similar time zone, we're going to look at um, a race that was on the 3rd of June last year. Um, and the conditions that we, that we want to uh, look for it's we're looking for a sprint race, and for the purposes of this approach, a sprint race is five or six furlongs, no more than six furlongs. I'm not including seven furlongs in this. I am not um, including seven furlongs as a sprint race in this. So we're looking at five or six furlongs, and we want the race or the predicted pace of the race, we want that predicted pace of the race to be fast. And we can see that on our race cars just here. Uh, you see where my uh, mouse icon is under the name. This is the, the, the race name here. Um, under that, we have predicted a race pace, and it is fast. And if we click on that, we actually get told what that means and what type of horses we should be looking for, uh, and you can read that there. I'm just going to close that again. But we're interested in the fact that it says fast. Okay, uh, that, That's the important thing. We're looking for a sprint race with a predicted pace being fast. Now, when we have um, a race like this, we end up in a position, normally one of two positions. Either we're going to have multiple horses that are likely to lead this race, or we're going to have a single horse that is likely to lead the race. Uh, and those are the two positions we can end up with. When we have multiple horses that are likely to lead the race, um, then actually we often get either one of the slightly slower leaders or um, one of the early pressers or mid-pack horses, one of the, the top early pressers or mid-pack horses winning. And the reason for this is they come in just behind the leaders and the leaders bolt off. They go super, super fast and they just cannot quite keep that speed until the age. They don't have the stamina to do it. They burn out of energy. Um, and when people talk about energy ratings, which I, you don't hear that much in the UK, uh, but when people talk about energy ratings, that's what they mean. They actually burn out of the energy in their body and it goes from using the oxygen energy into using um, the, the muscle mass energy. Um, and, and that's a very different energy. It's consumed in a different type of way, uh, and it, it works differently. Um, so they don't actually, they can't uh, get all the way up there. And this happens either when we've got multiple leaders who are all of at the same level, and they kind of just race each other um, really fast at the beginning. They each kind of are setting each other's pace too fast. Um, they all burn out of energy, and then those early um uh, those early presses uh, or those top uh, fastest mid-pack horses come in behind them and just take the win. Or you can also get it where you've got very close leaders. Maybe there's one that looks like it's going to be faster than the other, um, but it's close. Uh, and, and that one that's slightly faster than the other uh, can see the horse, the other leader horse right behind it. It's very, very close. And again, it keeps accelerating, keeps accelerating. It cannot keep that pace. It cannot uh, keep that energy level up all the way. And, and then the one that's just that little bit slow behind it comes in to take, take the race. When we have a single horse, um, then this horse, one single very strong um, lead horse, in this type of race, that horse wins the majority of the time because none of the other horses can catch up. It has such a lead at the beginning, the other horses can't catch up in such a short race. Um, so I hope both those two uh, strategies make sense. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we need to do for each of them. Um, and then we're going to look at this race. Um, so obviously we need to determine um, what's going on there, uh, whether how many horses are going to be. Let me just show you how we do that. 
So let's just jump in and show you. So I've got this race open here. It's a fast race, five furlongs. Um, so in order to see the pace, we just click on this horse icon up here on the top right. And you can see we get an overlay. And like last time, all of the overlays on the race advisor, they have the, um, the header bar, as it were, is in orange. So you know you've got an overlay on because the header bar will be in orange. And it just overlays on top of the other data that we have. So I've just clicked that up, and you can see we've got now, if I scroll up a bit, you can see we've got all this pace information. Leader score, lagger score, held up score, total pace, preferred pace, and running style. Now, don't worry, we're not going to have to use all of them, and I'm not even going to go through uh, what they all mean, because we only are interested in one column, and we are interested in total pace. Ignore everything else for the purposes of this approach. And we're interested in total pace, and we're just going to sort the race card by total pace, high to low. The higher that total pace score, the more likely it is uh, that the horse is going to lead the race. Okay, and uh, when we do that, we can see something very, very clearly. We can see immediately in this total pace column here, we have Balestros and Orsaf that look to be the strongest in the race. Um, both look to have a lot of pace, both look to be fast. Balestros is going to be uh, faster or expected to be faster in pace than Orsaf. I think that's how it's pronounced, Orsaf. Um, however, Orsaf is still, a lot based on the other numbers of the horses in this race, and we have to consider the other numbers in the race. No race is identical. It's all based, particularly when we're talking about pace, it's all based on the other runners. And we can see that based on the other runners um, in this race, uh, these two are kind of grouped together because there's a difference between them of around about 17. Um, but down here, we've got a difference of about 20. So we've got a biggest break coming in here because then it closes in for Wanin and Caledonian Gold. Uh, both of these have a score above one as well, uh, and they're the only two like that. And then under that, we've got Wanin and Caledonian Gold, who look to be sitting kind of behind those two in the front. And, th and then there's a bit of a drop-off to... Captain Ryan, uh, before we come down to the next two, My Susie and Brogan's Bay, uh, and then we get into the sort of the uh, the closers, the, the laggers in the race down here at the bottom. Um, so we can see that shape from those numbers there. And what we're looking at here is the fact that those two horses at the top look like they're going to be grouped together, but out of them, Ballesteros looks like he's going to be the fastest. Um, but like we were saying, we are going to have either a single horse that is much, much faster than the others. Um, and when I say much, much faster, I mean kind of like it's going to be um, if Orsaf was 1.11, you know, and then Ballesteros was maybe 1.35, 1.4. It's like a big, big gap. Um, clearly, this horse is going to massively outdistance the other. There is absolutely no shadow of a doubt about it. Um that's the sort of gap we're looking for. Um, these horses we expect to be fairly close together. And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons here. The first reason is that um, while there is a decent gap, it's not huge. Um, so we would expect normally it also have to maybe even be possibly an early presser, but right at the top, edging into you know part of that leader group. But notice the held up column next to this horse. And you will see... Um, also has a score of 1.14, which means this horse is likely to get held up. Um, and the held up figure just tells us a little bit of information about how this horse might get blocked or bumped or come out of the stools or anything that might delay it a little bit. Uh, and that slight delay means that Ballesteros is going to go faster, but this horse has the speed to catch. So this horse is then going to accelerate, or we would expect this horse to accelerate and, and be in there with the possibility. Um, so with that information, we are saying, well, okay, I am expecting one of two things to happen. Here. Either these two horses are going to race neck, neck and neck sort of thing uh, and tire each other out, and then either Wanin or Caledonian Gold are going to come in underneath and, and swoop that, possibly Captain Ryan. Um, or alternatively, um, Ballesteros is going to head off at a fast pace um, Orsaf is going to try and keep up but get a little bit held up somewhere along the line. Um, but Ballesteros, if Orsaf doesn't get that held up, that slight blockage until uh, after the start, um, Ballesteros is likely to accelerate significantly faster because it thinks it's got a horse right on it. 
um, which means that Ballesteros will then likely run out of energy and Olsap will come in and take take the lead um, towards the end of the race. Um, so I hope that makes sense. And um, that's kind of how we do it. So that's how we have the selection. So for, for us, it's one of those two here. Then we need to decide how to bet. We can always go in and have a look at, um, at, at some of the other factors if we want to. Um, and for example, we can see here, uh, first of all, if we sort by speed, I, I tend to use speed on these sprints because obviously it's the, one of the most important factors. We can see that all the stuff actually has the fastest speed from the last race, if we adjust the speed figure from the last race. Um, if we look at best ever speed, uh, just between those two runners, uh, they're here, let me highlight them so you can see them. There we go. They're very similar. Caledonian, uh, no, it wasn't Caledonian Gold, I do apologize, it was Ballesteros. Um, well, then actually in this situation, we can see Alsaf actually is better than Ballesteros. We're just looking at those two horses for the moment. Um, and also, if we sort by 5278, we can see um, Olsaf is ranked number one, Ballesteros number 11. Final key, and this is, I tend to use this in all strategies, number of days since last good race for Ballesteros is 500, and you can see it here, 588 days since the horse had a good race. I tend to not want to bet on horses that haven't had a good race in over a year. And this is a very good reason for doing so. That, for me, alone would take Ballastero out of the equation, and I would then be focusing on Orsaf. Okay, so that's that strategy. Um, if we look at the Betfair odds, and I've just sorted by Betfair odds, you can see that actually um, Ballesteros odds down here was 178, so we wouldn't have bet on that horse anyway. Orsaf turned out to be the market favourite. Um, Wanin uh, is coming in there as a possible as well. So, also as the market favourite, I would almost certainly have done this uh, with those odds of 2.09 if I was going to bet in this race as a back bet. But I might possibly have had a saver on either Winine and or Caledonia Gold. More likely, I would have had a saver on Winine, um, just so that if Winine came in, because we said Winine was in that early press of that mid-pack range, so just in case that eventuality happened, I broke even or at least recouped a little bit of my stake money. So I probably would have had a save on that. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. If you've got any questions on that, please uh, please do leave them there now. Um, Queen of Kalahari just won. Excellent news, Philippe. I hope you, uh, uh, I hope you were on it. Um, so we would have come out with, from that £10 stake, I can't remember, it was about £35, so around about 250% profit, something like that, um, which is excellent. Um, and again, you can see how the staking strategy we talked at the beginning starts to work because that's uh, that would return us about forty-five pounds. And if we were um, staking ten pounds a race today, that that alone has returned us uh, forty-five pounds ish. So nearly half of our entire bankroll for the day has already been returned on that one bet. Before we look at any of the others, so. Um, you can see why uh, that particular method in the short term when we're just doing a, a festival or an event that takes place over two to three days, maximum seven days, this process can work really well staking like this. Okay, if there are no questions um, about that strategy, I am going to move on to strategy number three, the instant analysis strategy. And if you think of any questions in the meantime, what I'm going through, please do just ask away. Absolutely no problem. Um, ask away. Um, okay, uh, we're still on here. So let's come back to our dashboard. Um, the instant analysis strategy. There are a number of races this will work on today. I'm going to take the first one um, that's coming up next. I know the 505 uh, won't work for this one, so I'm going to do the 540. Um, I say the 505 won't work, actually. There's no reason the 505 won't work for this. Um, Am I in the 540? We looked at the 540 a bit earlier. Let me just un-highlight some of those horses. Um, we could do the 505 instead. Hang on, let me have a look at the 505. Just wait for that to open. Okay, here's the 505. Um, and I will show you why I don't think uh, this strategy will work for this race. Since we've got a bit of time, I will do it on this race first, and then we will move to the next one, so you can see exactly why I would skip on this race. So the instant analysis strategy. 
Um, uh, for this one, the idea of this is to make literally as zero work as possible in the short term. And to do this, we're going to use the Monte Carlo simulator inside uh, the Race Advisor Pro software. And this tool is so, so powerful. And if you've been using it, then you will already know that. Um, if you haven't used it yet, you need to jump in and use it. Um, so how do we use this tool? Well, very simply, we click on this M up here on the top right. Um, it's kind of just above my head a little bit, just here. And you'll see when I click on that, it goes processing. And we get this um, overlay, shall we say, screen up. Um, and I'm going to press the rerun button there because obviously I was I was testing this earlier to see if it would work or didn't work. So I didn't know how much time we would have. Um, and this is what it's going to look like when you come in. And you'll see that um, the columns that can't be used in the simulation are already grayed out for you. We've got all the horses here down the left-hand side. We've got a couple of buttons at the top. And all the columns um, that we can use in the simulation are green and have a tick. If we were going to get into the advanced usage of the, the simulator, you can actually deselect uh, the columns. But for the purpose of this approach, we're leaving everything standard. All available columns can be used. We just click the next button. Again, the only thing that changes in the second step is we get these 15% appearing above every column. This is variance. This is an advanced um, setting. We do not need to change it for this. You can leave them all as they are and just hit the next button. So we've literally pressed next twice. And then we come up to how many simulations do we want to run. The default is 1,000. And again, you can leave this at the default. I don't recommend doing less. Uh, although you can if you want to, but I don't recommend it. Um, if you want to do more, that's entirely up to you. Um, I'm going to run a thousand simulations. And I just hit the run button and we get the progress chart at the top. Now, while that's running, um, if at any time you want to come out, there is a stop button that will stop the simulation. Um, now, while this simulation is running, it's doing a thousand simulations. So, what that means is it's simulating. Um, each horse running against each of the other horses a thousand times. Um, and while it does that, it's you can see stats appearing on the screen. Don't worry about those numbers, those figures. That's just so uh, if you're an advanced user, you can see what's going on. But you don't need to worry about it at all. We are going to use one very simple column uh, and one very simple approach. Um, so we just need to wait for this simulation to finish. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and when it finishes in a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the exit button. OK, and you see that exit button appears here and our progress bar disappears. So I'm just going to exit that. And I've exited the simulation because I want to sort the race card by the simulation. But while we're still in it, we can't do that. So I've exited the simulation and then I'm just going to press the M button for the Monte Carlo simulator again. And you see it will overlay the results. But this time. At the top, we can rerun it if we want to. We can exit it again. But we now have all of our ratings on here, as well as the results of the Monte Carlo simulation. And the results are down here on the left-hand column above the horse silts. I'm just going to sort by horse silts. And there we can see a nice curve of the finished positions that we expect these horses to take. So we expect Ice Pyramid to be at the or simulator, expects Ice Pyramid to be at the front, followed by good tidings coming down. And you can see the kind of distance between them. Now, for this strategy, we can either just eyeball this distance, but personally, I prefer to use the numbers. And I prefer to use the second number in. The number on the left is the odds uh, that the horse would have based on this Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, next number in is the percentage of races this horse won. So we can see Ice Pyramid won 12.13%. Uh, Good Tidings won 10% of the races. Uh, Bo Sam Ran won 953 And we can see that goes down. And what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for a big break. I'm looking for a sudden jump. Um, I'm looking for where it kind of goes, you know, 12, 10, 9, 3. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you, you get my, my, my meaning. I'm looking for a gap that is significantly larger than the rest of the gaps between horses in the race. And in this race, we just don't have that. We've got 12%, 10%, 9%, 8%, 7%, 7%, 6%, 6%, 6%, 5%, 5%, 4%. There's no real change. There's no gap between two runners that's bigger uh, than the av other gaps than average. Uh, so that's why I wouldn't use this race for this strategy. 
So I'm going to exit that and I'm going to move on to the 540 instead. Um, now, on the 540 race, it's a bit of a different picture. So let me just come in here and run the simulation again. Um, I actually ran this simulation earlier when I was checking which races we could do this on, so I don't need to run it again. If you'd like to see uh, me actually run the simulation again, uh, then I can do that. But because I've already run it on my computer, I don't need to run it again. So instead, I can just come straight in and sort in horse order of simulation. And immediately, you can see the difference even just in the silks. Uh, if you just look down at these silks, you can see a straight line, and then there's a sudden step in. And then we get that gentle curve that we had before. So you can see that here, straight down, sudden step in, gentle curve. And that's represented in the numbers as well, because we've got eight, eight, seven, seven, and then we jump down to five. And then we got five, five, four, three, 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 two, uh, in terms of percentages. So you can see that's represented there as well. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for um, those that, that break. And when we find that break in the race, um, we are looking to consider every horse above it. Uh, so in this case, that is four horses, Cracking Destiny Flames of York, Rocket Rod, and Frankie Darling. Um, so I'm just going to highlight each of those horses. I'm going to exit this and highlight each of those horses. So we've got Cracking Destiny, Flames of York, Rocket Rod, and Frankie Darling. So we've got Cracking Destiny. I'm just going to select uh, Flames of York, Rocket Rod, and Frankie Darling. And there we can see them now nice and clearly on that race card. Now, I hope that's all making sense so far that you're following me. Um, if you've got any questions up to date, please do drop them in uh, in the comments. Um, so that's all uh, quite nice, quite simple. So uh, we have a number of things that we can do here. Uh, these are now considered to be the strongest runners in the race. So the first thing we're going to do is let's actually sort by odds uh, because that's always telling. And the first thing we see is that there is one horse here, Cracking Destiny, with odds of 46. That's above my personal 29 to 1 or 30, as it would display here in decimal places. Um, so I would not really be betting on that horse. Past this horse, all of the horses have very high odds, 80, 90, 100, 110, 300, 400. So I am going to unselect Cracking Destiny because the odds are too high. And then I'm actually going to remove all of these from the race car by pressing the elimination buttons. To make the whole race card that much easier to read. Pardon me. Okay, so we've now not only have we removed a lot of runners, made the race card easier to read, um, we can now see that we have three out of those five that we are five horses are possible left. Um, one of them is the favourite, Frankie Darling. Uh, if we just press that M button again. We can see, oh, I've, I've removed some of those horses now. Um, Frankie, Cracking Destiny, where's Frankie Darling? Here we go. Frankie Darling uh, was the third one in our list. There we are. Um, but is currently a favorite in the market. Um, we saw my 5278, uh, and this is just a confirmation. Um, a lot of people tend to just go out and Dutch bet these straight away. Um, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, I tend to like to always have a little bit of further look uh, to just confirm a few things. So Frankie Darling and Rocket Rod are both um, here, and we can see that number one and number two in the 5278. Um, and then let's come over here. Uh, and see if there's anything that we like. No. So, Frankie Darling and Rocket Rod um, are looking good. Um, I have actually just seen a bug on Rocket Rod that I need to fix. Uh, and you'll see Rocket Rod hasn't had any races, um, but there are uh, 1,600 days showing since its last good race. Uh, this is a bug. Uh, this we've seen a few of these today. A couple have come through, uh, and this happens because there's a lot of new horses uh, running for the first time today. They are using names that belong to previous horses, and we have received the data with a horse ID that matches the ID of um, the old runners. So we are picking up uh, that this horse ran 1,600 days ago, and in fact it hasn't. 
Um, our developers are currently working on that to get them fixed, and any that are outstanding will be fixed very, very shortly. Um, so my apologies for that, but that is uh, ongoing at the moment, and that will be fixed. And in our quality control that we've been doing for the last, um, well, basically the last eight to ten weeks, the final stage of our quality control, we uh, we actually have found a way to prevent this from happening ever again in the future. So in the next couple of weeks, that will be implemented, and this will never happen again. Um, but at the moment, uh, occasionally we get a brand new horse with the same ID as a horse that had the name in the past when they send out the declarations. Um, and obviously our system then matches that and, and finds that information. But that will be corrected in the next kind of uh, hour or so, uh, and hopefully sooner because that's being worked on currently. Um, so that is why I'm not considering that days there since last good race. Um, um, so this horse we know nothing about, Rocket Rod. Uh, Frankie Darling looks to be strong. Uh, and Flames of York is, is kind of a little bit down here, which would match where its odds are. So what I'm going to do now is how are we going to bet on this particular race? So on this particular race, essentially, we've got Frankie Darling and Rocket Rod. We know nothing about Rocket Rod, but they are looking to be the strongest. Um, uh, Flames of York is the next in the field. So let's just come in and open up um, the race on Betfair. Uh, here we can see uh, the winner, and we can just see uh, Queen of Kalahari was 2.87 BSP. I think I actually took 2.7 or something there. Uh, I don't know if it will still show on the win market. 13.5 BSP there. Uh, that was a, a nice one. Okay, so 540. Here we go. So Frankie Darling is odds of two. Uh, Rocket Rod 19.5. And uh, for brand new horses, uh, the market is one of the best indicators going. Horses that have no history. Uh, the market is one of the best indicators going. Uh, we can always have a quick look at, at the comments if you want to on those horses. Uh, Rocket Rod, uh, Australian Colt Yearling. It's just here. Um, if you're looking for it. Closely related to three winners, including the winner up. Uh, worth a second look. Um, I tend to not place bets um, on breeding, uh, or at least bets not based on purely on breeding, um, and the reading here says it might have a chance. The market is saying, well, essentially, uh, it's uh, near the odds of 20, but at 19.5, the market is saying it's got a 5% chance of winning the race. Uh, that wouldn't be enough for me. I'm not interested. The only time I would be interested if, if that horse is favourite, second favourite, or third favourite, a good odds, you know, kind of like anything up to sort of seven, um, possibly ten, uh, but certainly not not going higher than that. Otherwise, I, I'm not interested in that. Um, and that's a personal thing. Uh, and that's because I don't put huge amounts of weight on uh, breeding. There are strategies that allow you to do that and approaches that allow you to do that. But this is not one of those that I'm using today. Um, so that essentially then leaves Frankie Darling, um, who, as it turns out, is, is the market favorite now. Um, and again, we're left with how would we bet on this horse? Well, uh, most likely the back bet, considering this seems to be uh, the strongest runner by far um, for us. Um, but we could look at the place markets, and obviously two to place, it drops down from evens to 1.2. And if we go to two places, 1.38. I mean, four places is going to be really low, 1.1. Um, AVB market, uh, it's not in there. Dream with me and Rocket Rod is in there. Um, and again, the, these markets, these A versus B markets can be very good if you are particularly keen on one horse or you think a particular horse is stronger than another one. Uh, the Monte Carlo simulator can be used to do that accurately. But again, that isn't part of this strategy. It's not part of this particular approach. But I can look at that in the future if anybody would like me to. So the way I bet on this is almost certainly I put the entire uh, uh, state money available for this race on Frankie Darling to win this race. And obviously, if that was £10, um, that would give you a, a £9.80 profit after commission. Um, okay, so let me know if there are any questions on that. I'm going to come now and, uh, and take some questions, uh, if there are any. Um, Philippe, uh, can accumulators and multiples be profitable long term? Okay, this is a great question. Excuse me a second. Um, let me just put that up on the screen so you can see it. Can accumulators and multiples be profitable long term? So the answer to that is a definite yes. 
However, to make a profit from them is hard. So the reason that uh, accumulators and multiples can be profitable long term and are actually some of, if you can crack them, they are some of the most profitable bets is because it's very hard to calculate the true odds on accumulators or multiple bets. Um, and because it's hard to calculate those true odds, not only uh, do most people get it wrong, the bookmakers also get it wrong, but it's not as important because um, almost none of the betting public can actually calculate that long-term value on them. And when you combine that with the long losing runs that you get um, from accumulators and multiples, uh, because obviously the, the overall odds of winning the, that multiple is significantly lower, um, by which I mean you might get 50 to 1 on your, your multiple, um, which means that actually the chance of that multiple winning is only going to be around 2%. So your strike rate of your selections is going to be significantly lower. You know, you're not going to get multiple selections winning 50% of the time. Pardon me. Um, you might be down at 10% or, or even 5% strike rate and when you're down at that level of strike rate your losing streaks are very very long um, that means you need a significantly larger bankroll or at least you need more points in it either your stake size drops or your bankroll gets bigger um, but more importantly you need to be psychologically prepared for those long losing uh those very long i should say those very very long losing streaks um so for example let's just say you were winning 10 percent well, that means that um, you can expect a losing streak of kind of 66. And that's a losing streak. That's not a downswing. That's 66 losing bets in a row. Um, and, and that's before you get into 66 losing bets and then like one win and then another 30 losing bets and then another win and another 40 losing bets. Um, so the downswings can be very long. And if you had even one a day, um, you're looking at, you know, possibly more than two months losing back to back um before getting a winner um but obviously the payoff is that um the profit when it comes is very high um, and it is if you are finding value if you have an edge on them then they can be very very profitable uh, but you have to be psychologically ready for that time frame for those downswings and you have to have your bankroll ready to actually cope with it to know that essentially this is uh, you can't look at these bets over a three-month period or even really a six-month period. You need to be looking at them at least a year. Um, so when you start, if you're going for long-term profits on these types of bets, you need to be prepared to stay in it for at least a year. Um, so you need to be confident in your approach prior to starting. Um, okay, I hope that answers that question, Philippe. Um, are there any other questions on either any of the strategies we've gone through um, in this session, uh, any of the strategies I went through earlier today uh, in the first session, or actually anything else, horse racing or race advisor based? Um, if you've got any questions there, then please do um, uh, drop them in now and I will answer them. Um, I'll just give a moment for that. If you want to have another quick drink. I feel like I'm advertising Coca-Cola here. I should have it in a, a bag or something. So apologies for that. But um, um, uh, yeah, I, um, I hope that all makes sense. Let me take that question off there. Um, now, the as a general note about horse racing, um, be aware uh, that. The racing is not exactly the same as it was uh, pre-lockdown because it is not open. The bookies aren't working in the same way. The on-course bookmakers are not there. So just be aware of that. Uh, no one's quite sure how that is going to affect currently the SPs um, or actually racing in general. Um, also be aware that the races that are taking place, taking place, there's slightly they're different compositions to what we may normally get. There's different horses in. Um they're possibly running on different ground conditions to the ones they would normally run at different times of the year. And we're also going to be getting jumps races coming in, um, which would never normally be run now. So things are not quite the same. So we're expecting to see some unusual occurrences happening. But that also gives us the opportunity uh, to come in and snatch out some uh, profits when we can pinpoint horses that are almost certainly going to enjoy the conditions in this new world that we are seeing. Um, so those are the horses to look for. 
Um, okay, as there are no more questions at the moment, I will say thank you very much for, for joining me. Uh, it's been wonderful to do both of these two sessions today. If you think of a question later on and you want to ask it, please just leave a comment under this video. Um, and it will be there. Uh, Facebook does save all uh, Facebook live videos, so you will be able to access them again from Facebook as well. Um, after this, if you want to go back over any of these approaches, um, have a wonderful rest of the day uh, racing. Enjoy it. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the first week racing resumes. Um, you know where we are. If you have any questions regarding racing or the race advisor, or our software, you know where we are. Please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Have a lovely evening, and I will look forward to seeing you in our next uh, Facebook Live session. Uh, take care, keep safe, and I will see you soon. Goodbye.